Hello, and welcome to Bold Identity, Bold Belief, where we equip the saints with boldness for the ministry by killing sacred cows, growing in God, and leaving the traditions of man behind. I'm your host, Cindy Carpenter, and before we begin, don't forget to check out the blogs for Bold Identity, Bold Belief at www.fromtheirstandpoint.com. That's from T-H-E-I-R standpoint.com. And click on the blog section for the show, Bold Identity, Bold Belief. As you may already know, this show has four sections. Sharing Powerful Revelation, Reviews of Faith-Based Books, What You Won't Hear in Church, and Through the Eyes of a Pastor. So let's jump right in to this episode of Sharing Powerful Revelation. How would you live your life if you knew that without a doubt that you cannot fail? How about if you were not subject to fear because you know you have the victory in every area, in every situation, in all of your relationships, in all of your finances, your health, on the job, with your children? Would that bring you joy? What would that do for your morale? If you are born again, these statements are already true of you. Legally speaking, the legal side of redemption was taken care of by Christ on the cross. Jesus was our substitute. Justice was completely satisfied. He was delivered up for our transgressions and he was raised again for our justification. So I'm going to go through the gospel with you today and we're going to look at what it really means to be saved. The gospel is like two sides of the same coin. Okay, there's two sides to the gospel. Most people only understand one side. There's two sides to the gospel, and this is where people are missing it. This is where Christians are born again, but they're living a defeated life, okay? Um, So the one side of the coin is who Jesus is and what Jesus did. That is so important. Without Jesus, without understanding who he is and what he did, what he went through and that kind of thing, we wouldn't be saved, right? And then there's the other side of the gospel or the other side of the coin, which is who you are because of Jesus and what you can do now because of Jesus. So if you picture it, kind of Jesus is the coin, right? You don't, he's the way, the truth, the life. He's the coin. He's the center. But then on one side, it's who he is and what he's done. And on the other side, it's who you are because of him and what you can do because of him. So living the the normal Christian life or the supernatural Christian life is not only possible, but we have not even tapped into the experience a fraction, like to experience a fraction of the power that is right now residing on the inside of us. It is absolutely phenomenal. It's the same power inside of us, according to Ephesians chapter 1, that God wrought in Christ, that he was working in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead. So if we think about it, this power is on the inside of us. Jesus Christ was crucified, right? He was crucified and he was unrecognizable as a man. That means he was whipped, he was beaten, he was so brutally marred, And then he, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made Jesus, Jesus who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus literally took on the visage of sin. He became sin. And then he gave up his spirit. He went to hell. He paid the price. And his body was put in the tomb. And in Christ, God wrought so much power, so much power as to completely take him out of hell up to his body, completely heal and restore his body, leaving just the marks of the crucifixion, the hands, the feet, the side as proof, right? Else we probably wouldn't believe and made him completely new. That same resurrection power, this dead raising, resurrection, completely cleansing, healing power is living 
and residing and abiding and dwelling and hanging out on the inside of every born again believer. Wow, that is absolutely powerful. I know it is. So let's look at, um, let's see, I have so many directions to go here, but I'm going to look at who Jesus is really quick and then we'll go into your identity in Christ. So who Jesus is, he's the son of God come in the flesh. The word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. That's in John chapter one. There are over 332 prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled by one man, Jesus Christ. That is absolutely phenomenal. So um, what Jesus did, what he did for us, the gospel is the power of God to everyone who believes. Also in 2 Corinthians 5.21, like I had said before, God made Jesus to become sin for us that we might be made into the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I also want to look at uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. I'll be flipping through my Bible a little bit, so you may hear some pages turn, and it may take me a minute to get there, but here we are. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 say, Jesus, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son unto Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that wonderful? This is what Jesus has done for us. And um, let's look at Romans chapter 3 also. Um, let me turn there. Romans chapter 3. And we're going to pull up verses uh, 21 through 26. Romans 3, 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, God, or whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So basically, we're seeing here that Christ has delivered us out of the power of darkness, out of the kingdom of darkness, and um, he has translated us into the kingdom of God, or God has translated us into the kingdom of Jesus Christ through the cross and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then now we're seeing in Romans chapter 3 that the righteousness of God is revealed without the law. Without the law. It's made manifest without the law. Without Moses' Ten Commandments, without what you do right and what you do wrong. The righteousness of God is being made manifested without the law. In other words, because you believe on Jesus Christ... Now you have become the very righteousness of God himself. His righteousness is made manifest in those that believe. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you so that you could be made into the very righteousness of God himself. So a question that helps kind of bring this into reality is this. How righteous is God? Well, he's the ultimate standard for righteousness, right? He's 100% righteous, obviously. And then, so how righteous are you if you believe on Jesus? Well, you're, you're not 99% righteous. You are 100% righteous because of Jesus Christ. That's something that we need to understand as a body. Um, this is what Jesus has done for us. 
And so it comes down to, since he's done all this for us, we can start looking at our identity in Christ. And for that, we're going to look over at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm just going to read this out to you. We're going to start in verse 17 and go through verse 21. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. So again, we can see that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. And we read in Romans chapter 3 that it's his righteousness. His righteousness is what is revealed. And he is the justifier of us. Hallelujah. So let's look over at Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, verse 1. So before I go on, though, I want you to understand that Christ, that God in Christ has made you righteous. A lot of people say, you know, once I clean up my life, I will give my life to God. Um, here's the thing. You cannot clean up your life on your own. You have to have the blood of Jesus. In Hebrews, it says that the blood of Jesus is enough to perfect forever them that are sanctified. So the blood of Jesus perfects us forever if we're sanctified by believing on Jesus. And the only way we can become sanctified is by believing on Jesus because he is the only way to the Father. He's not just a way to the Father. The Messiah is the only way to the Father. We can't rely on our own behavior. You know, we're going to mess up. You're going to mess up. I'm going to mess up. Other people are going to mess up. I'm not trying to prophesy here. I'm just telling it like it is. We live in a fallen world. We got bad habits. There, things happen. We get angry. But inside, our spirit, our spirit man, our spirit man is a new creation and 100% righteous before God. If we're born again, if we believe on Jesus, if we're saved, okay? I'm using all those terms because some people know one and some people know the other. Okay, so now that you know who you are in Christ and that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, let's look a little bit deeper into this and see, um, just have a little more confirmation and stuff from the scriptures. Galatians chapter 5 is where we're going, and chapter 5, verses 1 through 9 is the ones that I'll read here. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are that are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not from him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay, so there's a lot in this scripture. 
First of all, stand fast in the liberty or in the freedom that Christ has given you and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage or with the yoke of the law, with the whole bunch of do's and don'ts and trying to figure out if you're going to be good enough to get into heaven. And then he goes on in verse two to say, behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. That is talking about if you're trying to live by the law, if you're trying to receive healing by the law, if you're trying to receive the promises of God by the law, by saying, hey, I have no other gods before him, therefore I should receive healing. It's going to, it tells you right here, hey, Christ the healing of Christ, the finished work of Christ, the new creation of Christ, it shall profit you nothing. You're not going to get any benefit out of it because you're trying to be justified by the law. Righteousness cannot come by the law. If it could have come by the law, Christ wouldn't have had to come for us. And then it goes on to say in verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are trying to be justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So here it's saying that if you're trying to be justified by the law, you can't just be justified by the part that you do well. You have to be, you are a debtor to do the whole law. So maybe you say, okay, I don't covet my neighbor's wife. I don't I don't have any gods before God, but every once in a while I tell a white lie. Like somebody asks me if their food tastes good and I say yes when it's really disgusting, right? Um, hello, you're going, you're trying to say you can receive healing based on that you don't have any other gods before God, but here you are telling lies and being untruthful and that's not okay either. So by trying to justify yourself in one area, you are putting yourself as a debtor to every area. And you know, the thing about the law is this, no flesh shall be justified by the law. That's what the scriptures say. It's not possible, you guys. It's time to stop trying to do that. It's time to stop trying to relate to God based on how good you are and how well behaved you are and how pretty your flesh looks or how good you can make it smell after a really good shower or cleansing or church service or weeping or repentance or whatever. I'm not saying don't repent. You must repent. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying we cannot base our relationship with God on how good we are or whether we can receive healing or prosperity or deliverance based on how well behaved our flesh is, okay? Because Christ doesn't profit us anything when that happens. And actually in verse four, it says, you are the ones that are fallen from grace. That's, you know, a lot of people say that people fall from grace when they mess up and they, they sin. And that's actually not true. Um, that's not what the Bible says. This phrase, I'll read the whole verse for you in verse 4, Galatians 5, 4 says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So we can see that when you're trying to be justified by the law, that's actually the fall from grace that is the truth. You know, the enemy has really twisted that around to say that the people who mess up or sin or ministers that, you know, commit adultery or whatever, do financial crimes, the ones that were in the news a while back, that, oh, they're fallen from grace. Actually, they're not fallen from grace. Uh, they're sinning. That's bad. We're not condoning sin in any way, shape or form here, but that's not falling from grace. Falling from grace is saying that you should deserve something from God based on your own behavior. That's how you fall from grace, okay? So that's important to know. Um, it's by faith in Christ Jesus. That's how salvation is. Um, it's by faith in Christ Jesus. So let's look over at Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to go, um, we're going to start in verse 6. Ephesians, Colossians, 
um, Colossians chapter 2. Thanks for bearing with me while I thumb through my Bible for these verses because um, I, it's just better for me to do it this way. Okay, Colossians 2, 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, here's a warning now, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. This is a strong warning, you guys, a very strong warning. Beware, don't let anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, deceit, vain deceit, things telling you that you need to do something in order to be right with God except for believe on Jesus. It's really Christ plus nothing that is the key, okay? You can have all kinds of churches and religions and people that will tell you, well, yeah, you've got to receive Jesus and all your sins are forgiven, but then after you receive Jesus, whoa, you better watch out because if you sin, oh, you're going to be in trouble with God. And, you know, it is clear that the wages of sin is death, and I'm not condoning sin at all. If you sin, you're going to you're gonna get a paycheck, and that paycheck is going to be death in some fa form or fashion. And that's not, you don't want that, okay? That's just bad. Don't, don't get that anyway. However, your relationship with God, how much God loves you, how much God would do for you that you're saved, that you can run to him instead of from him. You know, beware that nobody takes that away from you. And then it says in verse 9, For in him, or in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Hallelujah. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, putting in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You have been buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all of your trespasses, blotting out the ordinances of the hand or blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, introducing or intruding into the things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding to the head from which all the body by joints and hands having nourished, minist or ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. So, these are some strong statements here in Colossians chapter 2. There's so much. So first it starts with in chapter or verse 8, beware, don't let any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of man and the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. So don't let people tell you that you have to do this in order to be right with God. You got to do that. You've got to say this prayer every day. You got to do that prayer every day. You got to read 10 chapters of the Bible every day. Now, before you get me wrong, I do believe you need to read the word every day, but it's not in order to be saved, okay? Your salvation comes from your believing on Jesus Christ, on the Christ. 
that's where your salvation comes from. But you do, you should read the Bible every day because when you read the Bible every day, you're going to start to know things like this and you're going to be less likely to be led astray because you're going to know what the word actually says. And then I want you to skip over to um, verse 16. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So don't let anyone tell you that Oh, because you celebrate Christmas, you can't be a Christian. Or because you celebrate this, you can't be a Christian. Or because you eat this, how could you possibly be a Christian? You know, those things and sayings are very prevalent in the body of Christ today or even in the world. And you know what? They shouldn't be. Because right here it says, don't let anyone do that to you. Okay? They are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So, Yes, there's some things to come. There'll be rules. There'll be regulations. There'll be things you should do and things you shouldn't do. And you'll get there and you'll understand that. But these are just a shadow of what's to come. So don't let anyone judge you by that, okay? The body is of Christ. It is of Christ. He is the head. And then it goes on to say, Let no man beguile you of your reward or talk you out of your reward in a voluntary humility. Oh my gosh. That's like, let me finish reading that verse for you. It says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into the things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. Oh my gosh. Okay. And not holding to the head, which is, which, and not holding to the head, from which all the body, by joints and hands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of who? Of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What does that mean? That means there's all these rules and regulations. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Can you abstain from this? Can you abstain from that? And you know, We start to worship our own will and not the will of God because we get so entangled in our own ability to be good, to do what we think is right, to abstain from what we feel like we should abstain from. And instead of worshiping the Christ that has set us free from everything, we end up worshiping people's wills or our own will and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe like how that person can like only eat vegetarian. I could never do that or something like that. And we start worshiping somebody else's will or how can you, how can you avoid sugar like that? You know, oh my gosh, you must be so strong willed or how can you exercise so much every day? You must be so strong willed. And then we start worshiping people's wills and it's, it's like we think we're being humble by saying I could never do that. But that's a false humility and we're worshiping their will. So that makes us not holding to the head, not holding to the Christ. We've got to remember that, hey, it is Christ in us that enables us to live the Christian life, to live, to live godly, to make godly decisions, to do things that are beneficial to our body. You know, Paul in in 1 Corinthians, he, he says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. But then here we've got to remember, you know, these ordinances and stuff, they have a show of wisdom in will worship and in humility, excuse me, and neglecting of the body, but it's not, it's not in any honor and it only satisfies the flesh. You only feel good in the flesh that you were able to withstain, abstain or withstand or whatever from those things. So, sorry, I hope I'm being clear. Um, 
we have that going on and we we have to be very careful of that because we've got to hold to the head which is Christ and Christ alone amen so let's look over at Galatians chapter 3 I know this is a lot for you guys today but I think it's going to be good it's a good foundation and we'll just hit on um, some smaller points I think in the next podcast we'll see we'll see what the Lord wants to do but um, let's go to Galatians chapter 3 And we'll look at, we'll start at verse 1 here. Okay. Galatians chapter 3 says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He therefore that ministers unto you, ministers to you the Spirit, and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? That's a good question, you guys. He does it by the hearing of faith, obviously. So we know that, I'm going to wrap this up here, but no man is justified by the law. Okay, we know that. No flesh is justified by the law, only by faith in Jesus Christ. So if it's by Christ we are justified, then it's by Christ we stay justified, not by our behavior. Listen, I'm not telling you to go out and be crazy. I told you Romans 6, 16 says that the wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is eternal life, but the wages of sin is death. So if you start sinning, you're going to get a paycheck and that paycheck is going to be death in some form. It's going to be death of a relationship or death of, it could be literal death. It could be a sickness, an illness. I mean, it could be anything. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life and Brothers and sisters out there listening to me, it is vitally important that if you sin and if you fall, that you run to Jesus and not away from Jesus, okay? We have been made sons and daughters of the Most High God, and our Father, our Daddy God, He can get us out of any situation, okay? The Holy Spirit is literally our advocate or our lawyer. So if you have sinned, and it says in the Bible, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you have sinned, if you have habitual sin, if you have, if you think you have just done it, and that is it, and you're just not even sure, like you're the one God closed the book on and said, I give up, I'm done. You're not that one, I guarantee you. Your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that has come down from heaven, for us that Jesus Christ sent, and we'll talk about him too. Um, he's your advocate, right? He's He's going to be your lawyer in the courts of heaven. So if you're saying, okay, I know I've sinned and the wages of sin are death and I've got all this death coming at me because I've really, I've sown to the flesh and I'm reaping corruption and I just need help. Cry out to God, you guys. Cry out to God and say, God, forgive me, Father, the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus in court. That's what I plead. I plead the blood. And the advocate will come up and say, hey, my client pleads the blood. And the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the word of Abel. The blood of Jesus says that you're righteous, that you're unblameable, unreprovable in the sight of God, God who knows all, God who sees all. And you know, if he's not seeing your sin, you should neither. Amen. But, um, He'll take care of you. He'll take care of it. So I'm going to pray with you. And then I'm going to wrap up this podcast. And uh, I hope that this has blessed you a lot. I hope that you guys will tune in next week. I'm going to be, or not next week, but the next episode, I'm going to be releasing a book review from one of the books that have really helped me in my walk with Christ and in my life. And I'm super excited for that. But let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will give 
all of these listeners, Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that they would know what is the hope of their calling and this glorious inheritance that they have, have in the saints, Lord, that, that you would show them that they would become to intimately know and understand this incomparably great power that you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your very own right hand far above all principality and all power and every might and every dominion and every name that can be named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And Lord, Father, Father of all, mighty God in heaven, we plead the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the advocate that will now speak on our behalf because we plead the blood of Jesus the beautiful blood that has cleansed us from all unrighteousness, the beautiful work of the cross that has made us righteous before you, that has washed away all the sin and all the consequence thereof. And we ask you, Lord God, to start reversing the death. Get We return that paycheck from the wages of sin. We return that. We don't want that. We're pleading the blood of Jesus, and according to the blood, we're righteous. Therefore, we shouldn't be getting that paycheck. And we thank you, God, for this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. So thank you guys for listening to Bold Identity, Bold Belief. It's a, podca a podcast to equip the saints with boldness for the ministry by killing sacred cows, growing in God, and leaving the traditions of man behind. If you have not subscribed yet, then I encourage you to subscribe to Bold Identity, Bold Belief, and make sure that you don't miss an episode. Who knows what I'll say? Who knows how I'll mess up the words? It's great. It'll be funny, but you'll learn a lot. You'll grow in God with me, and you'll get free from religion and free from the law and free from those things. You can also follow me on my social media, on my Instagram. You can follow me at Cindy Carpenter Ministries. You can follow me on Facebook, um, Cindy Carpenter Ministries, Karis Christian Church. You can follow me on my personal uh, ones too. You can also follow me on Twitter at azprincess0825. I would love to hear from you. If you're hearing this podcast, I want to hear from you. I want to know what you've learned, how it's changed your life, what the Lord has been showing you. You can also visit the website that is hosting my podcast. That's www. Dot from their standpoint.com that's from t h e i r standpoint.com and click on my show bold identity bold belief i'm hoping or i'm looking forward to talking to you guys next time and i hope to hear from you all and hear your testimonies about how good god is amen <music>